This was 2.30 a.m. this morning. This is the future state of the motion picture industry. Fifty-fifty by 2020 to get women to get the bigger budgets as well. It's very, very important that we put the stories in the hands of the people who own those stories. Are you, are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the TIFF Industry Conference. My name is Alan Convery. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Foundations here at TIFF. Uh, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Ashnabi, and the Huron Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. Welcome to the last session of day one for the industry conference, uh, just an hour or so away from a likely very welcome industry cocktail hour. Uh, this session is entitled uh, Guide to International Funding Partnerships and is part of our foundations program at the industry conference. This session is supported by Canada Media Fund. We thank them for their sponsorship of this session. Some house, yay, oh, yeah, give them a hand, yes. Some housekeeping notes for today. Uh, here, uh, please note that there's absolutely no professional video or photography allowed inside the studio. However, not to worry, because we are live streaming the conference to our website and the YouTube channel. Hello to our audiences that are tuning in now. Please do tweet about our session and keep the conversation going on our online audience, our hashtag at TIFF19. For this session today, our moderator, Valerie Creighton, from Canada Media Fund will encourage our esteemed panelists to share their thoughts on the co-production financing landscape to help each of you build your strategies for the future. On this note, I will hand it over to Valerie now from Canada Media Fund to introduce her guests and start the session. Over to you, Valerie. Welcome, everybody. So how are you? How's your first TIFF day? Good? Good enough. Now, just for our benefit, so our great panelists here have a sense who in the audience is a producer? Okay, so about a th almost two thirds. Who's a writer? Oh, great. Director? Showrunner? Who's the janitor? <laughs> Come on. Okay, we got one. Good. We got a good broadcaster. Any broadcasters in the room? I mean, we are in the CBC. Oh, dear. No. Bro Any distributors? All right, so we got the creative hub here. So it is my absolute pleasure to work with these people. We decided just before the panel that we're actually just gonna go right to drinks. You good with that? <laughs> okay, so, all right. I would like to welcome to this discussion Meiko Sazazna Kanali from the NFVF. The, she is the new CEO, three months, I think you said? Four months. Four months at the National Film and Video Foundation in South Africa. Welcome to Canada, welcome to your new job, and welcome to TIFF. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Diego Marambio, International Affairs Coordinator at the Argentine Film Institute, Inca, as we love to call it in Argentina. Welcome, Diego. <laughs> and beside me, Maximilian Leo, who is the producer CEO at Argentine Film Production in uh, which part of Germany? In uh, Cologne. In, in Cologne, and yeah. also very experienced as a co-producer around the world. So, thank you. We're going to talk a little bit with you about the perspective of these individuals from a co-production perspective and the schemes in their countries and the general field of co-production. Just from the CMF's perspective, as you, many of you probably do know, Canada can be a little confusing when we walk into the international market. We in Canada have over 56, 55 official co-production treaties that are administered by our dear partner, Telefilm Canada. And those are official, which means you have to meet a whole whack of criteria to get in the door. But of course, the advantages are the co-producing countries are treated like equal partners. 
When we got the mandate for convergent digital immersive media back in 2010 when we started and we're working around the world, those treaties often didn't speak to co-production in digital media or transmedia as it was called in those days or immersive content. So we started forming agency to agency agreements with countries around the world. We have one with Argentina, very new in, what is it no. in? Animated TV series and digital media, I think? Yes. 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 Okay, we have one with the NFVF in television series, and we have one with one of your major funders and sponsors, the Median Board in Berlin Brandenburg. So these agreements are very flexible because they're agency to agency. You don't have to go all the way back to government to change them. We know the market moves incredibly fast, so we can change them based on the needs of the countries. And the point is to shine a spotlight on producers from both countries, give them a little, often this is development money, often they're small, sometimes leading into production, and then some of them do go into the co-production actual treaties after that fact. So that's all I'm going to say about Canada. Everything's on the website. If you're interested, just look it up, because now we're, gonna, we're going to be listening to our really important guests. So, Mako, do you want to start first? Cosi is what we're supposed to call her, I'm told, because her first name is so beautiful, and I hope I didn't make a real mess of it. But anyway, would you like to start? So why don't you tell us about, maybe give the audience a little bit of a flavor about the structure in South Africa, the difference between DTI and what NVF does, and how that sort of funding landscape looks. Sure. So we are, um, as the NFEF, National Film and Video Foundation, uh, we act as an agency for the Department of Arts and Culture in South Africa. And what we really mandated to do is to grow um, the South African film industry. And we do that through a number of ways. We mostly give out grants for development, production, across training, marketing, and distribution as well. But I think at the core of why we exist is for transformation. Um, I think for a long time, the space was not fully representative of South African audiences. And that is one of our core mandates to ensure that there is transformation across the board. You then have the Department of Trade and Industry. And what they do is they offer funding as well, but mostly incentives. Um, and for people from international people seeking to either come um, co-produce in South Africa or um, do productions, shoot productions in South Africa, they offer incentives. And those incentives are layered. And what I like about um, how layered the incentives are is that they take into consideration an element of working with the locals, because that is important to us. So utilizing um, the infrastructure that exists within the country is um, important. We have amazing crews that are amazingly skilled, great locations. Um, and you have an opportunity as an international producer coming into South Africa to tap into um, those incentives. Okay, so we're going to talk about the incentives first and then we'll get into some sort of discussion. Diego, would you, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, Inca, the National Film Institute in Argentina, works uh, basically as a regulation of the cinema um, area and also it works like a fund. Basically, the most important part is the fund, is the, the, the money that we gave to help p uh, films to get done from the development to the production and then... Uh, exhibition, distribution, and international promotion. Um, the, for the production part, a film can get between um, like at least $215,000 US dollars, and the top is uh, 350,000 uh, American dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm just converting the pesos. Right now it's, right now it's something like that. Uh, but that's just for production cinema. Then we have a specific funds, like the, the one we have uh, with Canada, because we have the co-production agreement with Canada from 1988, but that's just for cinema. And this one is specific for animated series and that. Um, uh, also, we have a specific funds with uh, uh, Chile, Brazil, and Mexico right now, but also for, for films. And there is a specific uh, um, funds for Opera Prima, first movies, um, short films, and um, t 
TV series and documentaries. Digital documentaries and documentaries that aim to go to theaters. Um, that would be basically scheme. all that. And our agreement with you is new. We were yes, just, we, that's uh, brand, brand the new. government of Canada was just on a trade mission to Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia. And at the CMF, we signed with all three of those countries. We'd been in uh, conversation, I had an agreement with Mexico before and Colombia, but we're very new with Argentina. And I think the call is October-ish, I'm not yeah. sure. I think October Sunday. It's on the website. Like, don't no, ask the, for details. The, the, the close from the is uh, October thirty first. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, sir. Why don't we start with um, your view of the various, as many good, really strong financing schemes in Germany, and then we'll get into more of your production experience. Yeah. I mean, Germany is a very powerful country when it comes to co-production. It's very open. It's also like. Um, uh, focused on artistic movies as well as commercial. Um, and it's one, I think, of the strongest funding countries uh, probably after France. Um, but it's much more open also in terms um, of um, uh, foreign language or not German language. So it's, it's very effective. That's also why I, as a producer, uh, co international co-productions were always like something very important to us. Um, it's very complicated, the system. It consists of various different funding bodies. Um, and usually, uh, you can say as a rule of thumb, you need a German co-producer to explain it to you. And I did this, I think, like uh, to a hundred of people. And um, uh, I will try to keep it very simple. So basically, you can divide the German funding scape into three different columns. So the one thing is a typical tax shelter equivalent. It's a DFFF, so basically, on all the money you spend in Germany, depending on the amount you spend, you get 20 to 25 percent back, which you can put already into financing. So that's an automatic system. You fulfill the criteria. You get the part of the spending of everything you spend in Germany. You get it back right away? You get it back in advance, like you get it um, before production right. even. You can bring it completely into the budget. It's called the DFFF. It's super complicated uh, in the details, but fairly easy in the in the overall thing. And then you have a lot of different funds, and I think pretty different to a lot of different countries, but probably understandable from a Canadian perspective. You have federal funds, and you have very strong regional funds. I mean, in Germany, that's like really the thing. I think all regional funds together bring in more than 300 million euros per year into, uh, into film production, and that's only the regional funding. So they are as strong, if not stronger, than the federal funds. These regional funds are extremely flex flexible in their regulation. Basically, it's different from region to region, but basically what's important for them is spent in their region and creative participation of their, um, of their um, filmmaker landscape. So once you locate a production or a post-production in Germany, you will not only be able to benefit from the DFFF, but most times also from a strong regional fund. On top of that comes the federal funding, um, the FFA and BKM, um, one is like the more commercial one um, for big, uh, big productions, but it can very often happen that if you, if you happen to have like some A-listers in the, in, the, um, in, in the project, you have a strong package that really also uh, promises um, uh, distribution potential in Germany, then you can get this fund, and that's very good because you can spend this money all, always, even like outside Germany, so that's very attractive money. And the BKM is more for cultural money, and then the German participation needs to be majority, so it needs to be at least a majority German production, and most times it means also a German director, but not all the times. So to sum it up, you have these three columns, tax shelter equivalent, deep triple F, regional fund, and federal fund, and you can combine them, and then Germany becomes very, very effective. So let's talk a little bit about the overall funding landscapes and how, um, in, in particular, how the, like everybody needs co-production. It's hard to find money. It's hard to raise money to do production. People often look to co-production as a source of financing. Sometimes people chase co-production money to fill in that final box, which is never a good thing. I mean, one of the reasons we started with these small ventures was after our experience in Brazil, where producers went down there and did all their meetings and their B2B and one-on-ones, and then when we did the post-mortem, they felt that 
the content was so advanced, they weren't really looking for co-production money, they were looking for finishing funds, and there was no entry point for Canada. So the advice of our community to us was, if we're gonna do this, if we're ever gonna get like another blindness with Brazil, we need to start with the producers right at the creative idea and creative concept. That's sometimes hard to do when people are trying to find each other around the world. Um, it's one of the reasons we hope these small matching funds as we activate producers will help with that. But I'm interested to know too, particularly in the world now, we're in very interesting political environments that always affects everything we do. From your various perspectives, what's the political landscape as it affects film, television, co-production, and the agencies that you work with? Diego, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. In our cases, we are encouraged the co-production. And the way we started, for example, is like um, we also are part of Ibermedia and also right now uh, El Rimash. So you set all the, all the tools, and that's where the producers have to go to work. For example, we started the fund with um, the first one we started with was with Brazil, that we have different languages. But for, the, for example, the first year it was a, a fund of uh, 1 million uh, US dollars for four projects two minority from Brazil, two minority from Argentina. And the thing is that the first year we find that there was a not a lot of projects uh, um, submitted because they start to look something. So they start to work together and say like, okay, we have this money available, so we're gonna find a project to, to present. And the next year we have eight and the next one, and right now we have 14. Well, this year we are not doing it, uh, but um, hopefully next year we will do it again. But uh, uh, we are talking about that it was 14, between 14 and 16, each country, so it was a lot, but it started from, I think there was five projects the first mm -hmm. year. So we set, up, we set up everything, and then it's uh, uh, the producer's uh, job to go and find the, the rest of the money. For example, with Germany, we have a lot of uh, a project right now. It's, um, we're gonna be part of every March in this first call. Our first call is gonna be the, the one in, 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 the end in October. And there is three projects with Germany. Um, also, we started this um, fund with a Kenya Media Fund that is for development for animated series and series that is going to be on website or other media. And is one hundred thousand dollars, U.S. dollars. That is uh, about uh, one hundred thirty southern yeah, yeah Canadian dollars. Um, about seventy in Canadian dollars. It's the other way around. It's the other way. But uh, yeah, but uh, oh yeah. So, uh, sorry. That's okay. Um, no, because for me it's a stronger Canada, but it's okay. It's not my my <laughs> point of view, but it counts. So the thing is, um, I don't know how. Uh, right now we don't have a lot of of, of projects submitted because, of, of course, producers wait until the day before everything is the deadline. I don't know. I, I, no, that never happens here. And they have all yeah, the material I, in on time, and it's all perfect, and there's never. I any think that they like the yeah, rush because you you know you have the, the the online thing, and it's like everything can be go wrong. So yeah. let's kind of do it at the last moment. No, but they want to present the, the thing as best as possible. But we hope that it's going to be like a, a, I don't know if it's going to be a major success this year because it's the first year. Yeah. No. So we, someone wins, and they say like, okay, I can get that money and they're going to start to make a research about the producers in Canada and they uh, apply to, to attend to a festival mm -hmm. or a market to, to know uh, uh, producers and they start from there. I think one of the challenges in any of these programs is how to connect the right producers to the right producers because that's a, that's a big networking problem and producers do meet each other at festivals like this all around the world. But I think it's something as funders with these programs we need to take a hard look at because that's the first problem. And they, they are sometimes slow to start. I know with Ireland, I think, well, with Colombia would be a better example. I think I went there twice and it took about four years and it was very difficult in the political landscape at that time. And then we got started very slowly. I think we had three or four productions in the first year and now we're up to 14 after the third year. So once it kind of gets yeah. rolling, it can start to blossom, and then once there is a successful project that moves from development into mm -hmm. production, it becomes more attractive for others. So I think it's a, 
it's a scheme that you know you have to have a bit of patience with but also some vigilance yes. but I do think now that we've got five or six years experience on this the real question that I'm looking at in Canada is how do we now make sure these things get activated and the pro right producers meet each other and the, the actual money that is used is there to move that through into the production stream. So tell us about the political environment in Africa. I'm sure that influences what you do on many <laughs> occasions. Absolutely, it does. Um, but I think more than anything, um, it becomes a great enabler as well. Um, I think we internationals may see barriers, like I mentioned, that to access some of the um, DTI incentives, there has to be um, a partnership at a local level with the black-owned production company, which for us is very important. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that transformation is, is key. Um, however, I mean, we have about 10 uh, different treaties um, with 10 different companies, one, uh, countries. One is going to be finalized now in September with Brazil. Uh, we've done the most work with Germany. I think we've produced about 74 co-productions, and I think next to that is Canada. Um, and I think for the first time, there was a um, incentive for co-productions because we generally don't fund mm -hmm. co-productions. We don't have a grant for co-productions, and I think that is key. I think what we try and do as much as possible is we also enable film... Um, filmmakers the opportunity to travel to international festivals where they can meet with potential funders so we fund um, the um, international trips which I think is very important because South Africa the biggest funder of film is government right. there is not really huge appetite um, in private funders which is very limiting um, and also, I think, because of the way that um, these government departments have been set up, you've created a reliance on government funding. So it becomes very difficult for producers to go out there and have an entrepreneurial spirit and try and find um, funding elsewhere. And so I think that's one area that we're battling with, as well as distribution. Um, and currently, our public broadcaster is in disarray, which is unfortunate for a number of producers in the country because, you know, commissions all but dry up, which means they have to look to other sources for funding. And so whilst we have the likes of Netflix in the country and other VOD platforms, um, distribution still remains an issue. I think also the volumes that our filmmakers are producing is another area that we, you know, are paying particular attention to because right now, if you look at um, the production um, volumes of, say, a Nollywood in Nigeria, for instance, they're so far ahead on just volumes alone. And I think we have a big opportunity with made-for-TV movies, and I think that's where space for uh, potential co-production mm -hmm. partnerships and um, TV productions, because we don't fund TV productions, we mostly play in the film space. So, I mean, I think unlocking funds, and I think it's great now that we have the incentive, co-production incentive with the Canada Media Fund, because, you know, more than just signing these treaties with all these countries, you're also putting your, you know, your money where your mouth is at, and you're enab enabling the, the filmmakers. I mean, Canada has all these over 50 plus treaties, but really only five or six are used all the time yes. and activated with the major countries. And it's very rare that some of those other treaties are activated. So mm. we are very proud that we have a volume of treaties, but again, activating them and making them real is, a ch is often a challenge. Mm. We're not entitled in Canada, right? Like you guys are out there really entrepreneurial, getting all your money from elsewhere than government. Or Isn't that true? No, no, it's not. Oh, okay, I'm mistaken. Just kidding. I think, you know, any country in the world that wants to have its content in the forefront in the world has to have some support mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about this often in Canada about how to get off of the entitlement. Well, I don't know, Canada's a small country. We live next door to the U.S. We compete with them all the time, or, well, we really can't when it comes to that kind of volume of money. But, you know, many of our sectors are, um, have schemes that help support them, like manufacturing, oil and gas, and agriculture. So this sector is no different because we mm -hmm. have a very large contribution to the GDP in Canada, mm -hmm. and we're starting to promote that more. So, producer, you've done many international co-productions, mostly in feature film, 
although I understand you've got some TV in development and pre-development at the moment. So you've done lots of co-producing with other countries. What's your broader perspective about working internationally, the political environments, et cetera? I mean, like, you know, I think that's also important for all the producers in the room. We are, like, we, I, I as a producer always look like when, when I write an application, of course, the political climate and surrounding is super important. And like hearing you, what you speak about funds, you see that funds are giving the money strategically in order to nurture certain things, in order to like, grow relationships. Um, and a very good example, for example, is the German-French relationship. Like, so there's a lot of money going into encouraging German and French co-productions, and a lot of German-French co-productions are happening. And as a producer, I think it's super important to be aware of that, especially now where we live in a world climate where frontiers get more, more, more serious again. A co-production by, by essence is a frontier crossing um, cultural bridge building um, 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 endeavor. I mean, that's, and that's very important. So if you have a story that has this border crossing um, 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 essence that, that you have you, as a producer, you need to stress this out. You need to show it, and it becomes more important. If you, if you work on a, on, a, on a very exotic place and you see that there's a treaty and you do your research and you see that's maybe the first project in three years, and you write this into your application, you build this in, your project might have higher chances to be supported. And, um, and I think like uh, we did a lot of the so-called world cinema, we did like a couple of projects also with Argent Argentina, we didn't always put in border crossing, we always put in this thing, uh, f uh, needed to uh, try to push the things that the most yeah, what is the special thing about this project? What is it bringing together? What is the topic of the story? Why is this story also interesting in Germany? I mean, that's like one of the m biggest homework we have, of, we have as a German producer. When we produce a film from Kazakhstan, why is this story relevant to the German audience? It probably is not going to be a commercial theatrical success, and probably everybody will know this in the, in the funding uh, 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 committee, so it's no use writing this into the application. But it might be a festival success. It might be a Berlinale director who had the last two or three films in Berlin. So that's an argument why it's, it's bound there. It's, it might be that this director worked in his last film with German, German DUP and will do this again. So it might not be that the story is such a border crossing thing, but the production in itself and the creative collaboration of Germany can be big. And if these things are, are elements of the project, then great. But there's one thing also as a producer we always try to um, prevent, and that's doing a co-production for the sake of doing a co-production. It has to have a kind of natural reason why this becomes a co-production between these two countries. Of course, the best thing is if, if it plays in both countries, or at least in the other one, and the directors maybe from there, Sometimes you can make it, um, it, 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 you can make it like you will build a case why it makes such, so much sense to combine. Um, for example, if we would like make a film with South Africa, um, we would probably tell, we would probably look for a story that we can't find in Germany, but that might be relevant to Germany. And if we have such a story, then we could stress this out. And then, of course, the political climate is like part of this. Um, choosing and packaging and presenting pro process. So it sounds a bit like the art of storytelling as we face what we're all facing in the world and the world is becoming more, borders are coming up instead of going down in many cases. There's a real advantage to co-production because it starts to break that down. It starts to build relationships. It start, you take those relationships into other aspects of life and it possibly assists with what's going on politically in various landscapes around the world. Yes, of course. I mean, like, it's also like, I mean, a co-production is always a clash of mentalities, you know, like, um, p things are done differently in different countries. Um, sometimes things are done better. Sometimes you break totally with a cliche. I mean, I, I remember when we did our, one of our first co-productions was a Brazilian co-production, 
and um, they were so much more German than the Germans. I mean, they were so so on time. They were so prepared. They they were like uh, we were late. We were unprepared, and sometimes so it was like really um, uh, uh, different. But but then of course sometimes you co-produce in an exotic country, and and then it's like. Of course, it's a different mentality, and like a pos maybe in German it would be three positions. There you have 13 positions, and you pay maybe a third that you pay one position, and it's just done in a different way. And of course, you have to adapt to this. So, so from a producer point of view, a co-production is of course a life-enriching process. <laughs> um, but well, hopefully, yeah. but but hopefully the movie as well. You know, like a lot of of the movies are like. Um, you really travel to, to there and you see how life is in Kazakhstan, in Brazil, and especially if you're in the auteur cinema. And, and that's sometimes also important. Um, but of course, it has to be a bridge. You have to find somehow the angle, why is this important culturally or economically for your home market. Otherwise, what's the point? Yes. And I think you raise a very valid point because I think you can have as many co-productions as you want and you know, it's not about activating it at a superficial level that is just concerned with how you fund the actual production. Yeah. Um, but I think w some of the reasons why we find um, importance in co-productions for us especially is also about skills transfer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, you know, a big focus right now on Africa and African content, but I think it's important that those stories are authentic told authentically by, you know, African voices, you mm -hmm. know, so I think you're looking at a collaboration that is, that goes beyond just production, and I think yes. that's important. Yeah. I think for cultural exchange, it is important, but also we have, um, part of our mandate is social cohesion in the country itself. So I think you play, you know, across borders and are able to infuse different cultures, but only if it's done at, um, I think, at a very practical level and not just superficial ticking yeah. boxes and, you know, um, getting bigger budgets out yeah, of it. It needs to be a creative collaboration. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's, that's a very important thing. And so as a producer, you have to res the responsibility to make it a creative collaboration. And then you can also present it as a co creative collaboration and the success rate of getting the funds then will be much higher because I, 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 another thing we, we always say, like money never comes for free, and sometimes producers have this um, this idea that money from the funds, it's not money from the market, so it's free money. But it's not, it, it's coming with different interests. I mean, it might not be as purely economically as an equity investor, but if a fund invests in a project, they do it for some reasons. So we as producers, we have to understand these reasons. We have to understand the perspective. And if we then can present, hey, we are, we are, we are the reasons why you, you would uh, invest in a South African German uh, co-production are this, and, and we, we fulfill them, and we are doing this project, then of course it get, you, you, you have a higher chance of getting the money because it plays into the agenda the actual fund is, ha is having. One of the really important things we've observed, or I've certainly observed over the years, is in addition to the creative collaboration, sometimes it's really important that the individuals in those different companies share the same values as people. Yeah, of Because course. if you just, you know, you find the, finding the right partner, I think is absolutely critical. And that's often when people just chase the money or say, oh, South Africa has this great new scheme, or guess what they're doing in Argentina, let's look around the world for money and find somebody who's a producer in Germany we can find. It usually leads to a pretty much disaster often, like the money is often not well spent because it's like a, well, it's like a marriage. You're gonna be stuck with this person for a very long time and it doesn't matter how good your legal agreements are, when it goes down the toilet, it's for shit, like you can't fix it. I should know, I've been married five times. It's very difficult <laughs> to carry all that debt. And, so, and you know. a lot of co-productions um, uh, take longer than the average marriage time. I exactly, mean, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay, we're gonna talk about that after the panel's over. Um, <laughs> So I'm just curious, we're here at the Toronto Film Festival, you know, another observation we've had at the CMF because of our change in mandate, you know, film festivals all over the world were often quite pure, like they were about feature film. Mm -hmm. 
That's changing a bit. Even here at TIFF, we've had a couple of years screenings of the first episode of Big TV Series. We've had some digital media entries around the world. Our staff were just in, uh, in Venice, where there's a whole island just for VR production now. So content is changing. Content is content, regardless of the platform. Yes, of course, there's distinct differences in how it might be made. But I'm just curious to know what you're seeing from your perspective landscapes in the, in the I guess, transformation of content and the movement between TV and, and film and digital media, or are you seeing that? Well, I think that um, we are working on that for, for, with this kind of a specific fund to develop. This is for development, not for production. The thing that we have in Argentina is that the law says that the Inca has to give uh, the 50% of the fund for cinema. So we are right now with that in mind. Um, but the truth is that, um, yeah, content is content, and you have to adapt to what is going on. It's like um, cinema will not die. It's just going to change, mm -hmm. and we have to be prepared for that, because if not, it's... It, it's, it's like finding a new audience. That with the co-production is also important. Because one of the good things that have a co-production is that you, when you have a co-production approved, it will be treated in the other country as a national film. So they're going to find a new audience. And they're going to find a way to get into, in, into festivals in that, in that country. So it's all about the audience. To create the audience, for example, Inca is now for so many years now, they have a, a, a platform um, like Netflix, but it's a, it's a platform from Argentine content that it's Cinear, that it has a version in, in, in national, international, that, that you can watch content that is TV series and, and, and films. So the thing is that uh, you have to open to everything and watch what's going on. Because you can have the content if you have the audience, it's the same that nothing. Is because you're going to put it in a shelf, like waiting to what? So that's important also in the creative process. You have to realize where are you working with, like what is the audience for this? And if you want to expand that audience, you can think that maybe it's just go to a platform, maybe you can go to, to, to uh, festivals, or maybe you can find uh, a way to create a, a TV series or web series or, or something different. But you have to make the match with, with your creative process with the audience that you are want, want to, to reach. Um, Michael, Susanna, what about South Africa or yeah, Africa? I think, you know, he raises a very important point because I think we've found that for the most part, our filmmakers have been, I think, stuck in um, the idea of just theatrical releases or passion projects. You know, and it's either you go to a festival and you get all all of this acclaim or, you know, you open at a um, local theater and maybe it doesn't work that great because I think the audiences have not caught up um, or have not been fully developed. And I think we are seeing now um, parts of the industry with young filmmakers who are taking chances, who are trialing their content on social spaces, YouTube and um, Twitter and the likes. And I think it's important to develop an audience because I think a lot of the times right now, that comes at the end. You've now created a product and only at the end do you think, so who's you know going to be my distribution partner for this? And I think a lot more consideration right at the inception of the project um, needs to take place in terms of who your core audiences are. And if you're, you know, operating in a country um, like South Africa, where, I mean, our economic um, outlook right now has been slightly bleak. We just dodged a recession. Um, you're dealing with audiences that may not necessarily have the means to get to a theater. Um, and so you need to rethink your channels of distribution. Comment? I mean, Germany um, always was a super strong TV um, country, and TV wasn't supported by the funds because there was no reason, because it wasn't um, uh, uh, like culturally needed, and it was commercial. And but of course, now with the streamers, with everything is changing. TV is not any longer TV. I think that's a very important distinction. 
and um, we as uh, we consider ourselves for example a boutique film production looking out for directors or talent with signature styles and now we can like traditionally that meant theatrical releases only but now this is meaning also high-end series or um, even like uh, originals by certain streamers are, are like a, a film by so that's making that's changing the game and then that's interesting for us as well and, and i think germany was very progressive as a funding country we have um, funds that you can access for um, um, TV series you can, um, that you can um, ac uh, access for uh, um, 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 streamer, uh, streamer features as well as for s different funds than the theatrical. And then the regional funds in Germany are so super flexible that they can just like adapt by committee decision. And um, so, so that's why it's becoming interesting for us as well, because it's not as boring as it used to be 10 years ago working for TV. You're just not um, uh, 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 like enabling or like making a, um, a, a piece that's already clear from the beginning, but it's like becoming a creative process. And then of course it's interesting. And, and then of course a lot of audiences, especially like in more high quality uh, uh, or like auteur driven um, target audiences are not going any longer to the uh, theaters because they would need a babysitter and they are at home and then it's 11 a, a p.m. But and they the popcorn's $20 yeah, in the parking yeah, yeah, and and you reach them through 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 streaming um, um, platforms and you can and that's making it attractive and of course like it changes how we work it changes what our funds yeah. are supporting because they want to support interesting. Uh, uh, filmmaker voices and um, uh, uh, now you can also find them for streamers or TVs. Well, nobody has a monopoly on a good idea. Yeah. It can come from anywhere and really somebody told me once, Valerie, if the CMF is not on the side of the content, whose side are you on? A platform is just a delivery mechanism yes. for an idea and a story. I have to tell you though, in the last 48 hours, I saw two things that took my brain into a realm it's never been. We just hosted a big symposium with a bunch of UK CEOs, BBC, Arts Council of England, UK Immerse, the whole bunch, an equivalent in Canada. And at the end of the session, uh, the woman who does the digital um, integration from the Royal Shakespeare Festival showed us a clip. Uh, it was the 400th, I think it was two years ago, or maybe a year ago, 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare. And so they had felt they had to do something really spectacular that really changed it up. And they did a production of The Tempest, and they built a hologram of the character Ariel through a VR application. And the little clip showed how they got to that. This was unbelievable. I mean, that character was flying all the way, 3D throughout the theater. The actor was on the stage. The incredible innovation using the technology to bring that audience immersed into that story in a different way was something like I have never seen. So her point was, they had a thousand people through the theater at Stratford every day for this. They did a Snapchat version, same creator, same content, same actors, put it on Snapchat, 7.5 million in one day. So that just, get, to me, that was a prime example of how aggressively things are changing. Last night at the opening of um, Band of Brothers, the Robbie Robertson story, and if you haven't seen it, go. That's all I'll say. But at the end of the film, which is quite extraordinary in itself from a historical perspective, Robbie's son did this little piece to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Take a Load Off Annie song. I forget the actual name of the song. Uh, musicians, singers from all over the world that were interclipped and singing together and take, it was phenomenal what this kid did with that song and it just took you into other countries and other places and the heartfelt expression of what that piece of music meant to those performers. So it's quite phenomenal the way the world is changing. We're going to open it up for questions, I think. Is there anything else burning that any of you want to speak to? I'm going to get you to wrap up in a minute with a very profound statement of what people should do. So you can be thinking about that while we ask for questions from the audience. All right, we're going to pick on people if there are no questions. Let me see. Who can I pick on? Um, how
have a question, sir, in the second row there in the brown shirt. Any question you want to ask? Yeah. See, this is what happens when you don't volunteer. When I moderate a panel, you get picked on. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, see? <laughs> well, this has been uh, really interesting. Uh, a lot of insight uh, towards the importance of getting to know well your co-producers and getting to know well your partners. And I recall what you mentioned about the importance of bringing directors and producers to festivals to meet. And I think that is amazing because it's a great starting point. I started like that. I, I came as a student to my first festival. But what about the continuity? Because one thing is to, to meet people, and we can meet wonderful people here. But how do we encourage them to keep meeting in different festivals or different, different uh, platforms? Or what can we do to open more doors to longer relationships? Hound them every day. Hound them. Send them an email. Call them. Send them no, a picture sure. of yourself. Just keep <laughs> at them until they say, OK, I give in. We'll meet again. I, I, I might have an answer to the question. Um, a, be a better one than that one. No, but there are examples. Um, for example, I mentioned the German-French relationship. and. Um, uh, out of the funds, um, for example, there's like even a masterclass. It's called German French French Masterclass. Um, it's um, and it's like um, a further education program that's like funded by both nations. And of course, like the, the the people who are working there together for over a year, they have lifelong relationships. Um, EAVE um, or ACE um, um, further education programs and um, or inside pictures in Europe. Um, also financed by the funds um, are doing the same thing. I mean, like my WhatsApp group with my inside picture group is one of my the first things um, I ask when I need a certain question. And like um, uh, I did the class years ago. So um, like these things, um, like especially further education programs, and you find a lot of them on festivals also, like Rotterdam Lab or Berlinale Talent Campus, or like in in Cannes, TIFF, you have also one, and and um, you know, you have a Sundance lab and stuff like this, like all, all these further education programs at festivals and sometimes even like check it out. I, we even don't, didn't know what Germany is all en enabling in, in terms of further ed well, education. Transatlantic partners. Yeah, transatlantic partners, and Canada. especially German yeah. Can Canadian program. Great, great program. Um, really great. And there you meet like lifelong um, working relationships. Yeah. On serious note, though, I do appreciate it's difficult. You know, it, it's such a tough industry, and it's so difficult that, generally speaking, generally speaking, people will find a partner, they'll build a lifelong relationship, as you say, and then they tend to go back to that same partner over and over again. But I think the thing is, you just you have to be a bit focused and clear on what you want to achieve. I think it's hard to make that connection that you can build upon unless you're really clear on, A, what you want, and then finding the right partner for yourself. And then eventually those relationships can get forward, forged. But I've watched transatlantic partners now for quite a long time. It's one example. There are many around the world. And it is a really incredible way to get yourself in the door and start meeting people from other countries. Because both the German, the yeah. German organization and its um, Jan Miller in Halifax runs it on the Canadian side. And it's really a fantastic program. Yep. Just to add to that, we are in May of this year at the Cannes International Film Festival, for instance, we met an amazing woman um, called Rebecca, I cannot remember her last name, but she offers classes on um, the great festival attendance strategy. So she literally sits down with producers, filmmakers, and gives you a proper strategy before you go to a market in terms of how to network, how to unlock those doors, how to pitch, etc. And that's one of the things that we've now taken on for our own filmmakers that we fund to travel to international destinations. We make sure that we have a market readiness workshop and literally take them through and guide them how to you know, maximize their time at a festival. But I think, like um, you were saying, you cannot stress enough the importance of pestering those people, yeah. of following up, because I think once you've been enabled and brought in touch with um, international counterparts, then the onus is on you to make sure that, you know, you do a follow-through on, on those networks. 
And I think more and more agencies are starting to build. I know at the CMF with these international matching funds, we built a bit of a database of producers in both of those countries. I mean, you still have to do your homework. You still have to look that company up, see if they're even making content that's what you're interested in, and build those relationships. But at least the contact points are there. And pretty well every country that I can think of has a producer's association. In Canada, we have them in each province and territory as well, and provincial agencies. And internationally, many, many countries have producer associations that you can work through if you're looking for a producer in an animated series or something that is of interest. Other questions? I'm going to pick on somebody else if somebody... There we go. Oh, we got two hands up. Yay. Hi there. Uh, I've got sort of two very short questions. The first one would be, uh, is there uh, a threshold where um, the, the, the amount of the spend wouldn't be worth doing uh, like a co-production? Like, did you need, is there like a minimum spend you need to do in the countries, first part? And the second, uh, the second question would be, how much does the actual content of the film influence whether or not uh, the countries would get involved? Like, if it, there's like something political, like LGBTQ content or things like that. Like, are there anything that the countries, uh, these particular countries, might stay away from? I'll let well, you start, well, Diego. Yeah, um, in Argentina, the first part was um, you. Uh, it depends. Is it going to be a, a majority production from Argentina or minority? The only request that we have, depending on the on the um, agreement, is a technical and artistic uh, uh, participation from each country. So you have to have at least, if you're a minority, you have to have uh, two um, technicians from a, a, a from a major department, like a sound mixer, uh, post production, and that, and two actors, one in the main role and one in in, in a supporting role. That's the only request that, in general, we have. Then there is the part that there is a, um, uh, they, they make an analysis from the, from the script that is relevant for the, but not relevant in the meaning that it's, it's, it's good or bad. It's relevant because it depends on the jury that, that they read it. It's not as if it have to be an Argentine story necessarily. Um, if it's hard, it's better. For example, in the, in the agreement that we have with the um, Canadian Media Fund right now, it is 20% the minimum that requests for each country and, and, and 80, but we're encouraged to make it 50-50, like uh, the same amount of, of, of uh, um, artistic and technical uh, and, tec um, and crew, uh, and the story in the possible has to be a Canadian Argentine story. The good part about that is that um, at least in Argentina, we are an immigration country, mostly. So there's always an Argentine somewhere. <laughs> so there is a story to tell there. Uh, so as far as you know, we go, there's no minimum necessarily on, for co-productions. However, for accessing the incentives for the DTI, there is a minimum spend. Um, and you can check out their website the dti.gov.za, um, it gives you an indication of the threshold as well as the additional incentives you may get if you do your post-production in the country and if you use a black-owned production company to assist you with that. But for co-productions, I think we work pretty much on the same um, level where there is a requirement that it is truly a proper co-production. If the funds are 50-50, that's fine. Um, but that also collaboratively as well, um, there is representation across the board. There's not necessarily any topics that we would stay away from. Um, yeah. For Germany, um and I think generally you can speak, you can say for the threshold, I mean, every fund is different, but if you have less than 20% contribution, it, will, it might get tricky um, in a country. And also you might think twice if it's like worth all the complicated work on your producer side. Um, if, it's, if it's close to a third, it's, it's, it's very natural to do a co-production. If it's more, even better. Um, in terms of topic, um, the more political, the, the better. But of course, it, 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 it also needs to have some commercial viability or like um, um, a chance of a distribution in Germany. If you don't have this, then it's difficult. 
um, but other than that, the German f f funds are supportive, like especially in LGBT, especially in min minority themes. Even in our cultural tests, it's a plus point if it's um, um, a political uh, reason or if it's like a, a topic that's important for minorities or if it's about social injustice or something, it's a plus instead of a minus. Um, other than that, um, of course, like funding doesn't support porn or horror movies. Like um, even horror, you need to have be elevated, but something without any clear cultural um, 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 element, any any something that that elevates the project culturally, becomes hard to finance. I think in Canada, it's the criminal code. Anything that violates the criminal code is just not going to be accepted for sure. And of course, pornography. Although somebody said once, you know, if we funded pornography in this country, we could fund everything else. <laughs> um, which might or might not be true. I guess it depends on your view. And in terms of topics, again, you know, it is, it is for us at the CMF, even in our convergent stream, which is the big pot of money, we still, the majority of that money is decided by the broadcaster except for development. And it's up to them in terms of their schedules. And that's really the gatekeeper still for us. But I think budget-wise, it depends what you're doing. Like, if you're doing a web series, that's a whole different question. And can you do web series as co-productions? We're starting to see some of that develop. So I think you have to make a judgment call. It's, it's expensive, it's time, it's money. And the money has to be there to you know, make a worthwhile project that you can get to distributed to audiences somehow, somewhere. We're all, we are out of time. So, oh, there was one more question at the back. We're just going to take a second back there to get this question. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yes, uh, Tisho is global from South Africa. Um, I wanted to ask, it's quite related to the gentleman's question, um, but related to cost. So if your story cannot be tailored um, to fit in a German actor uh, or a German cast member, unless in like a very minor role, what would the chances of a co-production be? Already shaking your head. No, it's not a problem at all. I mean, the rules are super flexible. It, yeah. it, it, you can't say it's no problem at all, but if there's, uh, I mean, we did productions, uh, we did a lot of films without any German actor inside and co-produced the movie. We did sometimes only the co-production and the uh, sound mixer and the color grader were from Germany. So like, it's, it's fairly easy. So the world is open. Three yeah. second words of wisdom. Uh, well. <laughs> Okay, you lost for two okay, seconds. No, okay, I will say that um, most of the story deserves uh, to be told. You only need to know who are you talking with, where, when, and how you're going to tell the story. Okay, go see. Uh, South Africa is a great location, great destination, perfect weather, favorable exchange rates. Come to South Africa, do not delay. not words of wisdom, that's a sales pitch. <laughs> Max? I would say one very important thing, and that's like, if you're not able to finance um, a, pr a, pr a project by yourself that you never should have meant to be a co-production, chances are very high that you're not able to finance it as a co-production. So it's not the holy grail to finance things that you cannot bring uh, into green light. But if you have a project that's maybe suitable for co-production and you can finance at least a great part from your home country, then a co-production might be a very good idea. Mine would be get the right partner. Do that homework at the outset. Save yourself time, energy, and money. And then make sure you value each other and because the fight's a long, hard one. And uh, try to have some fun. It's a difficult world out there. So the world is open. Let's, as Canadians, thank our international guests and thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our esteemed guest panelists. Uh, please join us in the industry lounge right now. Talk about all the ideas that you heard on the stage over cocktails and some hors d'oeuvres. And we'll see you tomorrow at the conference. Thank you so much.